you're, you're doing work now with a postdoc on having to do with the quantum physics. There's long been this idea. I mean, there's a seems to be finding in quantum physics that the 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 the, uh, the wave function, you know, when an electron is not yet in a definite state. And so it's really just a wave of, you should think of it as a wave of different probabilities of different places it might be, or maybe in a sense different places that it in some sense is, whatever. But, but, but it's not a single electron in a single place. It's long been held or known that measuring the system, measuring it, collapses the wave function, at least in some very common views. And so the, the act of measurement forces the, the wave function to collapse. And, and so in a certain sense, measurement encourages the universe to come into definite existence, you might even say. Now, I think, you know, some people are taking this to mean, well, it's the conscious measuring being. It's the physicist who's bringing, who's watching the measuring device, who's bringing the wave function into definite uh, specific, uh, to a specific kind of point. But my view, my, my impression was that most physicists have abandoned that idea, and they think it's just the physical interaction of, of the thing with the physical macroscopic measuring device, whether or not a person is there watching, right? Well, no, I mean, this is kind of at the intersection of two big problems, the problem of consciousness and the problem of interpreting quantum mechanics. So the line that I'm pursuing now is really motivated from trying to solve both of those problems and see if they will meet in the uh, the middle. Starting from the problem of consciousness, you talked about the water into wine problem. My view has always been that you've got to take consciousness as a kind of a fundamental component of the universe in the same way we take space and time and mass and charge as fundamental, then consciousness is fundamental too. Once you take something as fundamental, then you don't just abandon theorizing about it. What you try to do is to try and find the laws that govern it. So everyone's going to say maybe there are some laws that say certain physical configurations give you consciousness. But the problem that's especially relevant for us today is the problem, what does consciousness do? What role could it possibly play in physical theory? And most physical theories just look as if the physics part, the space, time, mass, charge, and so on part, is completely closed. Certainly that's what you get on classical Newtonian mechanics or even relativity. What's interesting about quantum mechanics to many people is at least seems to leave open or open a new possibility for how consciousness could get into a physical system. Because in quantum mechanics, at least as classically interpreted, there's two kinds of dynamics. There's the wave function which moves along according to the Schrodinger equation in a certain fairly straightforward way. But also, every now and then, the wave function undergoes a special kind of change, which is collapse. And then when and why does collapse happen? Well, according to standard quantum mecha mechanics, it happens on measurement. Next question, what's measurement? That's where we people normally throw up their hands. That's the that's, um, fundamental uninterpreted notion of quantum mechanics. But, and people call this the measurement problem. What is measurement? How could that play a role in quantum mechanics? And at least one idea that goes back a long way is, here's how we should understand measurement. Measurement is, in fact, the place where consciousness comes in. Measurement is when a physical system affects a conscious observer. Now, you're absolutely right. This view is not especially popular among physicists or even among philosophers of physics these days. One reason why it's not popular is that it's dualistic. It takes consciousness as something fundamental and non-physical. For someone like me, that's not such a problem. I'm already motivated to, to um, endorse that kind of view. But, but it's also, to... uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's also an interactive dualism, not in the traditional Cartesian sense of your consciousness influencing your body, but in the sense of the con consciousness in some other sense influencing the physical world, right? It's absolutely, this is a way of having a physically, an interactionist dualism, which unlike Descartes' interactionist dualism, is consistent with physics, where the role for consciousness in the physical world is present right at the basic level of nature, consciousness collapsing wave functions. Now, as I was saying, most physicists project this, but it's not really because they have better alternatives. I mean, there's a Raphite. Some people try and do without collapse of the wave function altogether, so-called many worlds views or hidden variables views. You probably don't have time to explore those, but they all have, they all have problems. But if you try to hold on to the, 
basic idea, there's a special kind of interaction called measurement that collapses the wave function. No one knows how to draw that line. Um, you can't just say that's when it's big enough or it's complex enough. Some people try to do it by decoherence and macroscopic systems, but that just leads to a version of the many worlds interpretation. So anyway, long, long story short there is there's at least a possible kind of view, the consciousness collapses the wave function, that has been, once upon a time was popular, is now widely dismissed, but which I think has not been seriously explored, has not been well enough explored. What I'm trying to do in my work with uh, Kelvin McQueen, who is currently a postdoc, well, he's just moved from being a postdoc at Tel Aviv to being tenure track now at Chapman University after working on a PhD with me at ANU. Um, but we're seeing if we can take that old idea and actually make it mathematically rigorous, that consciousness could somehow exert a causal effect on the dynamics of the, of the wave function so that when there is consciousness, the wave function collapses into a definite state. One idea we have is that consciousness is special and unlike regular physical properties and that it never enters into quantum superpositions. Space. Wait, 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 wait. Conscious, you're saying consciousness never enters into quantum superposition. superposition. So a, a electron in quantum mechanics can be, you know, needn't be in a definite position here or a definite position there. It's standardly thought of as being in a wave function in which it's in all these positions at once. It's right. This wave specifies a superposition of all these positions. And any physical property, it seems, can enter a superposition. But here's a hypothesis. Consciousness is special. Consciousness never enters a superposition. It's always in a definite state. You know, what would a superposed consciousness be like? Well, what would a consciousness in a definite state be like? I mean, you know, it's just hard to conceive of in general. Okay, well, let's take this hypothesis at face value. And now the thought is, whenever a superposed physical system affects a conscious being, mm -hmm. then, well, if it if the whole system kept evolving according to Schrodinger dynamics, the brain would have to go into a superposition of you know, seeing the particle there and seeing the particle there, and you'd get two different consciousnesses or a superposition of two different consciousnesses, seeing the particle there and seeing the particle there. Ah, that can't happen, though. Consciousness is constrained to always stay in a definite state. So somehow this forces the brain, consciousness is entangled with the brain, in quantum mechanical terms, so the brain is forced to go into a definite state, that's a collapse, and thereby the, everything in the physical world which is entangled with that brain, just by the standard mathematics of quantum mechanics, will now collapse. So, th so the thought is, if you spell out this story in the right mathematical terms, it starts to look as if the point where consciousness comes into the process is also the point where things collapse. Consciousness goes into a definite state, this puts the brain into a definite state, this will ultimately lead to certain definite consequences, my, including, among other things, if my consciousness goes into the state of seeing the particle there rather than there, this will cause the brain to collapse into a neural state, which causes the report, mm -hmm. I'm seeing the particle there rather than there. So there's a potential causal role for consciousness in driving verbal reports. This is the point where maybe we could combine this with your theory for an unholy hybrid that does everything. Well, it certainly has some... It faces some challenges in common with my theory. I mean, I, it's a long shot. I, I mean, like, for example... Speculation the, and a long shot. Right. Like, so when you said consciousness somehow influences the wave function, well, the word somehow kind of reminded me of, you know, somehow uh, w once you get to self-conscious uh, beings, a previously latent and epiphenomenal uh, consciousness starts exerting influence on the world. And, and, and of course, in both of them, I, in both cases, you say, well, wait, wait, what do you mean somehow? It's sketch it out. And in both cases, you know, it's almost, uh, even if I hadn't told, you know, hadn't assumed epiphenomenalism up to that point, I would still face the problem you face, which is the wine into water problem, not the water into wine problem, but the wine into water problem. Just, just imagining, conceiving, articulating what it would be like for this thing called consciousness to influence the physical world. And I, I don't think anybody... Well, my view, it's just a it's simple, straightforward, fundamental law. Everywhere in physics, some things are taken as fundamental. Some properties, like space and time and mass. Yeah. Some laws, like, say, the law of gravitation. People said to Newton, how does it happen that these two massive properties exert this for, force on each other? He said, well, that's, some things have to be taken as fundamental. In my view, consciousness is fundamental. Yeah. So certain laws, certain principles but... involving it are also fundamental. And here, 
that'll be the constraint that consciousness can't be superposed is a fundamental principle. And the effect that will have on the fundamental dynamics is the moment any physical system potentially becomes entangled with consciousness by that mm -hmm. law of consciousness, it too will have to go into a, uh, into a definite state. So I think you can actually make the mathematical dynamics fairly straightforward. There are, some, there are a few problems there. But once uh -huh. one does that, the basic principle here is just that's taken as fundamental. And the thought is, mm -hmm. it's okay to take some things as fundamental in your theory as long as they're simple enough. And our hope is this might be simple enough. <laughs> okay. okay. I mean, I would say even in Newton's case, he says, well, you just have to accept these two things exert a force on each other. Actually, Einstein said, I'm not willing to accept that. And he came up with a system which had its own hard to imagine things, but it did simplify the gravity problem in the sense of depicting it as stuff just kind of rolling along a space-time landscape of a space-time continuum or something. Anyway, Einstein felt he had taken the spookiness out of gravity. So it is, you know, it, it, it's, it's not unreasonable to demand that when somebody says, wait, just accept it as fundamental, you say, no, I would like something more. I mean, uh, yeah, fair enough. And if someone wants to come up with a successor, maybe the way is mm -hmm. open to come up with a successor theory, which is even simpler. But at least by my lights, I think you know, if you can well, state some fairly simple mathematical equations, namely probabilistic, even if they're probabilistic, to get the dynamics right and explain the data, then that's at least okay. a can. So, so the the premise is kind of that uh, there's something about consciousness. Well, it's almost like it's, I don't want to say inherently monolithic, but it resists, well, maybe you could say that, right? It resists fragmentation. It resists it's, superposition. It's yeah. a substance that will not put up with the uncertainty it's of quantum physics. Yeah. And so it's like, in order to render the world intelligible to it, in a, is that another way of saying that? In order to render the world intelligible to it, 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 it insists that the electron, that the wave simplify itself. Well, this is really anthropomorphizing consciousness now, which is... Well, a, that's, if, if there's anything you should be able to anthropomorphize... If anything, then... So, yeah, you might think... Con a somewhat more down-to-earth way to put it is that consciousness, by its very nature, can't be superposed. It's, you know, we can't even conceive a superposed consciousness. It's the kind of thing which, by its very nature, is always in a definite state. And if that's too strong for you, let's just take it as a fundamental constraint, fundamental law of nature. Consciousness happens to resist superposition. There are some stories you can tell about why it would have to be that way. But if it turns out to merely be a fundamental law, consciousness resists superposition, that would be good enough for me. Well, I think if you're allowed to call that a, a fundamental law, I should be allowed to say it's a fundamental law that epiphenomenal consciousness uh, begins to influence the world once a being becomes self-conscious and linguistically proficient. <laughs> but in any event, in any Maybe event... Maybe that calls out for explanation. <laughs> in any event. Um, so <clears throat> you could take this... I mean, this reminds me in a very distant way of certain kind of mystical views of the world, which is that consciousness is inherently unified, and even the seeming independence of our own spheres of consciousness is a kind of illusion, right? So that, that I mean, that on the one hand, that's a very different type of claim, but it has in common with your view the idea that the natural and true state of consciousness is, is indivisible. The way I was thinking about this view, there are many different spheres of consciousness, all of which could be independently collapsing the wave function, mine and yours, and maybe even a dog's or a fish's could all be collapsing the wave function. There could be version. There's another kind of view where there's just a universal collective consciousness, maybe that underlies all of reality. I entertain that kind of idea in different speculative moods. I'm not really sure how to how you'd go about combining that view with, uh, with this view um, of consciousness collapsing the wave function. Maybe a single universal consciousness is like God's consciousness is always looking down and collapsing mm -hmm. the wave function and we're all components of that consciousness. To me, that would complicate the view. There is an idea that some people have taken seriously in different contexts. The, you know, Barclay, the great idealist, thought right. that we were all components basically of the mind of the physical world all exist within the mind of God. People are now reviving that kind of view sometimes without the God. Well, so that's a different direction. A couple of questions. So, it is your view, I take it, that it isn't just when quantum physicists are using these instruments to measure electrons that consciousness plays a kind of causal role in some sense, but when animals are just viewing the world. Is that is that the idea? Yeah, I mean, this view is, can be combined with different views about what the threshold of consciousness is. I mean, mm -hmm. you're going to need a theory of where consciousness kicks in, and then the claim is going to be whenever that happens, that's when wave function collapse happens. So if consciousness kicks in in fish, 
then fish, every time a fish makes an observation, that will collapse the wave function. If conscious kicks in at the cell level, which is possible, cells collapse the wave function. If it kicks in at the level of humans, then only humans collapse the wave function. I'm inclined to think consciousness goes a long way down the natural order, and so does, uh, so does wave function collapse. But there'll be nothing special about measuring instruments. What's mm -hmm. going to be special is where, in fact, consciousness arises. Mm -hmm. And second question, so is this an example? You know, I've heard the phrase, the ontological primacy of consciousness, which means consciousness is more fundamental in the physical world. I've heard it in the context of, like, uh, Asian Indian philosophy or so on. I, there are kind of somewhat, I, I guess, Buddhist versions of it, maybe, and Hindu versions of it. But is this is this an example of that? I would say no, because this is this is still a version of dualism. It says there's the physical world and there's consciousness. They're separate, but they interact. Mm -hmm. I think of the Buddhist view as more a version of what philosophers call idealism, which is there's right. only consciousness, and the physical world comes from that. It's the flip side of materialism. Which says there's only physics and consciousness, and the, and the Western version that. of that is Berkeley and the the yeah. Western idealists. Another version, which has been popular lately, is panpsychism. Right, there's consciousness in every particle throughout the universe, and the interactions of all those give us the physical world. So that's a, it's an idea which I think is very much, which is worth taking seriously again in very speculative moods. But it's a different idea from this view where um, only there's physics and there's consciousness and the, and they interact. If it turns out that if everything was consciousness, then this view couldn't work because consciousness, wherever it's present, collapses the wave function. And we know that wave functions don't always collapse. Electro, you know, photons will give us interference effects in a double slit experiment. If photons were conscious too, they would collapse the wave function. You wouldn't get the interference effect. So for this theory to work, we need some bits of the world that don't have consciousness mm -hmm. and that don't collapse the wave function. So it's probably actually inconsistent with that. Of course. Of course, panpsychism uh, doesn't tell us what consciousness is for, right? It's just a theory that it's been there even in the prebiotic world. No, yeah, that's right. Although it's very naturally combined with a view where certain physical entities, maybe even certain physical properties, essentially involve consciousness. You know, maybe mm -hmm. mass, what we call mass. We really understand it by the role that it plays in physical theory. Maybe that's actually consciousness playing a role there in physical in physical theory. On panpsychism, the physical world is itself a whole bunch of connections among the conscious, conscious properties of little entities. So that's naturally associated with a view of the causal role of at least micro-consciousness. The role of mass is to resist acceleration and to induce gravitation. So the role of consciousness might be to do that as well. How that connects to the roles it plays in us, no one really understands. But if you wanted to speculate in that direction, you could combine you can combine panpsychism with a causal role for consciousness at the very microscopic level. Mm -hmm. 